Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is doubly fed induction generators. Our objective is to introduce doubly fed induction generators. We'll examine how a doubly fed induction generator can maintain synchronous speed while operating at different rotational speeds, manage reactive power requirements, and export real power for use. All right, kiddos, this is it. If there is any lecture worthy of running out the biggest stadium in the biggest city and projecting on the biggest movie screen accompanied by a pyrotechnic show worthy of a white snake concert, this is it. Doubly fed induction generators. D-F-I-G. D-Fig. The event of the year every aspiring technician wants to attend. If you reach this lecture with your sense of dignity still intact, you have indeed come a long, long way. In fact, since we're anticipating a sellout crowd tonight, the bouncer working the velvet ropes out front has been explicitly instructed to turn away boring and unattractive people and anyone that has yet to complete the induction generators, synchronous generators, and doubly fed induction motor lectures available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If this describes your sorry state, make haste to correct this oversight and return when you're so qualified because we are packed to capacity and the show is about to begin. In preparation for tonight's show, allow me to relate a tale of my childhood that, believe it or not, is a perfect warm-up for the main event. You kids these days live in a kinder, gentler era. Back when I grew up in the cultural dark ages of the 1980s, one of the ways 1980s parents expressed disdain for their children was to make us play ball sports, like baseball, football, golf ball, basketball, tennis ball, soccer ball, numatsli, or pelota maya, a ball game in which the winners are ritually sacrificed. Now, you might like ball sports, and that's fine, but I don't. I don't chase balls because I'm not a dog. Anyways, one summer, my parents signed me up for soccer ball camp without my consent. The summer camp was way worse than you can imagine, largely because the soccer ball coach was having an affair with the art teacher at the time. Rather than instructing us in any soccer ball skills, he just hung out with the art teacher all day and made us run laps around the athletic field. Despite directing a majority of his attention to his artistic pursuits, if you know what I mean, this guy was like a peregrine falcon when it came to detecting and exploiting any signs of weakness or exhaustion in youth. The only coaching I got that summer amounted to him yelling, Jimmy, you run like a wimp. You better pick up the pace. After a couple of days of this, I was like, I got to learn how to run. So I went to the library, which is kind of like the 1980s version of the internet, and checked out a book about running, which explained all these well-thought-out training regimes you could do to become a better runner. I read that book from cover to cover that night. And when I finished, I said, forget that. There's got to be an easier way to survive this season. So that very night, I broke into the highway department across the school, stole a bulldozer, and excavated the entire athletic field. Kind of like what Ultron did to Sokovia in Avengers Age of Ultron, if you know what I'm talking about, and I'm sure you do. Rather than smashing the field to earth like Ultron planned to do, I instead mounted the entire field on a three-phase AC motor with a variable frequency drive, set the field back in place, and returned to my bed that night and acted like nothing happened. Next day, I walked out onto the athletic field and coach is like, I want to see you wimps running around this field at four revolutions per minute. So I started walking nonchalantly around the track at 2 RPM. Coach was quick to encourage me with a well-timed shout, pick up the pace, Pytel. So rather than picking up the pace, I kept walking at 2 RPM and adjusted the variable speed potentiometer on the motor drive to start turning the entire athletic field, hurdles, high jumps, goals, end zone bases, and all at 2 RPM in the same direction I was walking. As a result, to any outside observer, it seemed like I was going 2 plus 2 or 4 RPM. Coach left me alone for the rest of the warm-up. A couple minutes later, Coach shouted, Warm-up is over, ladies. Get going. I want to see you running at 6 RPM. So I broke into this half-assed 4 RPM jog. On top of the 2 RPM motor assist, this made it seem like I was going 4 plus 2 or 6 RPM. After a couple minutes of this, I was like, this sucks, and dropped back to a 3 RPM trot. At the same time, I stepped up the rotational speed of the field to 3 RPM, all the while appearing to move at 3 plus 3 or 6 RPM to the outside. This system worked really well for a couple weeks, and just when I thought I was going to make it out of that hellhole alive, things started going wrong. First, for some reason, the system got stuck at two revolutions per minute in one direction after a heavy rain. No matter what I did, I couldn't adjust the speed anymore. This wasn't bad, though, because I always had a 2 RPM boost, and this was just enough of a boost to keep me from dying that summer. That is, until the second glitch happened on the last lap of the last day of the last week of practice. There I was trotting along with a 2 RPM boost when the coach suddenly shouted, All right, ladies, eight revolutions per minute. Conspicuous pause. 
in the opposite direction. I was like, oh, this is going to bad suck. And suck bad it did. To maintain the desired eight revolutions per minute in one direction on a circuit that was revolving two RPM in the other necessitated me running at 10 revolutions per minute, something that I hadn't done in a long, long time. After an entire summer of me dogging it, I quickly gassed out, fell to the ground to an outside observer, started going 2 RPM backwards. This is when Coach caught on to my little scheme. You'd think I would have gotten in trouble for this. You'd think you would have heard about this unbelievable story on the internet. But Coach and I came to an agreement that day whereby he didn't tell my parents and I didn't say anything about his affair with the art teacher. Until now. True story. Anyways, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, doubly fed induction generators. How in the hell does a doubly fed induction generator produce three-phase AC with fixed output frequency despite a variable speed prime mover turning the rotor at different rotational speeds? Let me show you how. Viewers are no doubt familiar with traditional synchronous generation, whereby a DC source known as an exciter establishes a fixed electromagnet on a rotor and then some external mechanical power source known as a prime mover, like moving wind, falling water, or expanding steam, turns the rotor inside a set of stator windings. The properties of the result in output voltage generated out in the stator windings of a synchronous generators are related to the inputs in the following manner. The physical construction of the stator windings influences phase shift. The rotational direction of the prime mover influences phase sequence. Field current magnitude influences voltage magnitude. And finally, prime mover rotational speed influences both frequency and voltage magnitude. Additionally, we learn once synchronized to a larger grid, a synchronous generator can manage real power export by increasing torque and reactive power needs by adjusting field current. Synchronous generators are the workhorses of modern society and generate a vast proportion of electrical power. This being said, they're known to be large, expensive, and somewhat complicated. Additionally, since rotational speed directly influences output voltage and frequency, they're not exactly the best choice for variable speed applications. Wind power, I'm looking at you. Sure, if you are a hydropower facility with 537,000 acre feet of water stacked up behind a dam or a nuclear power plant with a lifetime of fuel at your disposal, it's super easy to divert a controllable amount of water or steam into a turbine such that it maintains rotational speed and thus frequency inside a very tight predictable range. Wind, not so much. Wind blows when it wants to as fast or as slow as it wants to go in whatever direction it's blowing from only to switch directions, speed up, or stop altogether the next second. Long story short, a wind-driven synchronous generator would be a dumb idea. Not to say that it hasn't been tried. One of the ways you could use a synchronous generator with a variable speed resource like wind would be to perform what's called full conversion. Or an electrically excited or even a permanent magnet synchronous generator is essentially driven at whatever speed is driving it by the variable speed resource so it produces wild three-phase AC meaning three-phase AC without any regard for proper phase sequence, phase shift, voltage, magnitude, or frequency. The result in wild three-phase AC is then converted entirely DC using a power electronics device known as a rectifier. The DC output of the rectifier is then converted to tame and docile three-phase AC with the correct magnitude, frequency, phase shift, and sequence suitable for export to the grid using another power electronics device known as an inverter. A synchronous generator with full conversion can work for variable speed resources, but as you might guess, it's expensive and complicated, principally because the power electronics device is central to full conversion must be sized to accommodate the full output of the generator, meaning if any little part in this larger system doesn't work, the whole thing doesn't work. I'm not saying synchronous generation with full conversion doesn't work, but I am saying there are some complications. Ask me how I know. For this reason, other generation methods exist that might be better suited for variable speed resources. For example, consider plain old induction or asynchronous generation. It's not the sexiest nor the smartest type of generation, but it is cheap and allows for some variability in speed. Viewers recall an induction machine driven above its natural synchronous speed can act like a generator and exports real electrical power. A wind turbine generator making use of a simple induction style generator could theoretically self-regulate rotational speed inside a given range by catching or spilling excess wind by pitching or turning the blades into or out of the wind thereby keeping generator output inside a desired specification. This does allow for a degree of speed variability, but not much. Also, it needs to be mentioned, induction generators have a dirty habit necessitating the constant consumption of reactive power to create a rotating magnetic field central to the induction process. Viewers will recall a synchronous generator, in contrast, can operate at unity power factor by adjusting field current to under or over excite the rotor. 
we've essentially got two choices, each with desirable benefits and undesirable drawbacks. First, synchronous generators, which do allow for a fine degree of control over reactive power, but need to be driven at a fixed speed. And second, induction generators, which do allow a degree of speed variability, however necessitate the constant consumption of reactive power. Wouldn't it be great to have a third option that allows a degree of speed variability and control reactive power? It's at this point in the show, D-Fig busts through the stadium wall like the Kool-Aid man, climbs to the top ropes and does a backflip into the ring accompanied by the Scorpion song, Rock You Like a Hurricane. D-Fig is the ideal third option, the best of both worlds, one which offers both a degree of speed variability and control of reactive power. For this reason, a significant number of modern horizontal axis wind turbines make use of this style of a generator. Despite the title, doubly fed induction generator, this is actually an extension of synchronous generation. I explain the possible origins for this misnomer in the aforementioned doubly fed induction motor lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, and I'll probably do so again since it infuriates me to no end. Despite the erroneous title, you can't deny the results. Fixed frequency output given variable speed input and the control of reactive power, the best of both worlds. What makes double fed induction generation different from traditional synchronous generation is that the physical position of the rotor and the electromagnet on the rotor aren't tied together and can be independently varied. If the variable speed prime mover is driving the rotor too slow, the rotor electromagnet is sped up so it keeps the two magnetic fields aligned and output frequency remains constant. If however the variable speed prime mover is driving the rotor too fast, the rotor electromagnet is set to rotating backwards so it keeps the two magnetic fields aligned and output frequency remains constant. That was the point of me telling you the entertaining story of my youth. The resultant rotational speed of two rotating bodies adds up if they're going in the same direction and it's the difference if they're spinning counter to each other. You will never forget this explanation and that was the point. This is how doubly fed induction generation works. Given a variable speed rotor, one can change the rotational speed of the electromagnet on the rotor such that to an outside observer, i.e. the stator, the electromagnet appears to maintain constant rotational speed. Consider a two-pole pair per phase generator that necessitates an electromagnet past the stator windings at 1800 RPM clockwise to maintain a 60 Hz excitation frequency with a proper phase sequence. If the rotor is turning at 1800 RPM clockwise, the electromagnet can just pick a spot on the rotor, sit down and enjoy the ride. This is traditional synchronous generation with constant zero hertz on the rotor. Let's say the variable speed prime mover hits a lull and slows down to 1770 RPM clockwise. To keep excitation frequency at the desired 60 Hz, the electromagnet starts running laps on the rotor at 30 RPMs clockwise. Result is an electromagnet that turns at 1770 plus 30 or the desired 1800 RPM. This is hyposynchronous or subsynchronous operation, a generation below ordinarily synchronous speed, something a traditional synchronous generator is incapable of doing. In hyposynchronous mode to keep the speed of the electromagnet constant, the electromagnet needs to revolve on the rotor in the same direction as the underspeed rotor. Let's say the variable speed prime mover absorbs a sudden gust and speeds up to 1860 RPM clockwise. To keep excitation frequency at the desired 60 Hz, the electromagnet starts running laps on the rotor in the opposite direction at 60 RPM counterclockwise or negative 60 RPM. The result is an electromagnet that turns at 1860 minus 60 or the desired 1800 RPM. This is called super or hypersynchronous operation, a generation above ordinary synchronous speed, again something a traditional synchronous generator is incapable of doing. In hypersynchronous mode, to keep the speed of the electromagnet constant, the electromagnet needs to revolve in the rotor in the opposite direction as the overspeed rotor. Long story short, as a variable speed prime mover drives the rotor at inconsistent speeds, the rotating magnetic field on the rotor is so adjusted such that the electromagnet passes the stator windings at a fixed constant speed, thus the resultant excitation frequency is maintained at that specified desired value. Additionally, while in operation, the field current to the rotor can be adjusted to under or overexcite the rotor, thus changing reactive power requirements. In summary, D-Fig is the best of both worlds, fixed frequency output at variable rotational speed input and the ability to control reactive power requirements. Allow me to demonstrate. 